Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to our sessions again. Today we have these sessions to discuss about what is Buddhism. So in this sessions I will talk about Buddhism 101 to give all of you a brief introduction of what is Buddhism in a very generic way. So what is Buddhism? What is Buddhism to you? What is Buddhism to other people? What is Buddhism to other religion? So some people say that is Buddhism a religion? Buddhism a philosophy? Buddhism a faith? Buddhism life? Or Buddhism, what is Buddhism? So this sessions we will talk about what is Buddhism and how Buddhism spreads to all around the world and how it transformed to different types of Buddhism. As all of you are aware that there are different types of Buddhism in our society now. We have Chinese Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, Korean Buddhism, Japanese Buddhism, and Sri Lanka Buddhism, Thailand Buddhism. Buddhism, the middle way of wisdom and compassion. A 2,500 years old tradition that began in India and spread and diversified throughout the Far East, now including the Western country. A philosophy, religion, and spiritual practice followed by more than 300 million people. It based on the teachings of the Buddha. So in general, Buddhism is a very traditional ancient religion believed by people in India and subsequently spread around the world believed by different traditions, different races of people. And it's not just a religion, it's also a philosophy. And most important, it is talking about what is life, the life of people, the life of all sentient beings. And it's based on what? Based on the realizations of the Buddha. The three jewels of Buddhism. In Buddhism, there's one thing that's very important that all of us has to be aware of. That is the tree jewel, or we call it the tree treasure. So what are the tree treasure? First, the Buddha, the teacher. Buddha to us is a teacher. He's not a god. He's a teacher that he realized something. He understands something. And he share with us something that he realized about life. The second, we call it the Dharma, the teachings from the Buddha. What type of teachings? The teachings of life, how this life function how we are living in. So these are all taught in the Dharma. And third, the Sangha. The Sangha is the community of the monastic that decided to depart from their family and practice for their own liberation at the same time to help other people to liberate from the suffering. So Sangha is the missionary of the Buddha. He's transmit the message to all of us about what the Buddha taught. And also at the same time, he practiced these teachings in order for himself to liberate from suffering. So who was the Buddha? He was born in 563 BCE, known as the Siddhartha Gautama, a noble caste in India. He was raised in a great luxury to be a king in future. However, he empathy for the suffering of others. At the age of 29, he rejected the life of luxury to seek enlightenment and the solutions to suffering. He followed the strict ascetic lifestyle for six years and realized that this is not the way to, to liberations of suffering. And that's why he rejected this extreme practice and decided to sit under the Bodhi tree and meditate. And finally, he achieved the nirvana awakenings to the truth about life and become the Buddha, which so-called the awakened one at the age of 35. So he, after his enlightenment, he spent the remaining 45 years of his life teaching others how to achieve the peace of mind he had achieved. So the Buddha, to all of us, he is a teacher. He's a human being like all of us. The only difference is that he realized what is life. He understand what is life and most important, he know how to transform from the current situations to the peace of mind. So he want, his objective is to teach us, to let us know how can we lead a peace of mind. And that's why he spent 45 years traveling around India to spread his uh, understanding of life. 
And what did the Buddha teach? His first teachings was the Four Noble Truths. What are the Four Noble Truths? First, to life is to suffer. Life is suffering. The cause of suffering is self-centered desire and attachment. That's the second noble truth, the cause of suffering. The solution is to eliminate desire and attachment, thus achieving nirvana. This is the third noble truth, telling us about there's a situation whereby we are able to release out all kinds of suffering, to liberate out from the uncomfortable feeling, and that's the end of suffering. And the last, the fourth noble truth, the way to nirvana is through the practice of Eightfold Path. This, the fourth noble truth, is to tell us the way of how we practice in order to lead to the mind of peace, to be able to release out from suffering. So this was the first teachings from the Buddha to the five uh, monks as the first five disciples he received. What is the Eightfold Path? <clears throat> the Eightfold Path is the wisdom, which are right understanding, right motivation. Second, the moral discipline, right speech, right action, right livelihood. The third group, mental discipline, right effort, right mindfulness, and right meditation. So all this combines to become the Eightfold Path. And I repeat again, the Eightfold Path are right understanding, right motivation, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right meditation. In this four Eightfold Path, this Eightfold Path is not a practice for just for the uh, Buddhists. If a person who are not a Buddhist, but he practiced this Eightfold Path, it's able for him, to, him or her to lead a better life. For example, using the right speech, we won't be scolding other people. We won't be using language to accuse other people, to curse other people. This will help us to lead a peaceful life in, in our family or working environment. So an Eightfold Path is not just for Buddhists, but also for everyone in order for these persons to lead a happy life. What do Buddhists believe? Buddhists believe in three things. One, Buddhists believe in rebirth, which we call it reincarnation, result from attachment. So in Buddhists, we believe not just this life. We believe in past lives and future life. But past life is what we create from the past to lead us to have this life. And future life is what we create now to have a future life. So in, if we are creating a bad actions in this life, then we will know that in next life, we might have bad uh, reputation or result. So this is called rebirth. Second, Buddhists believe in nirvana. It's a peaceful, detached state of mind. What is nirvana? Nirvana is not a place to go to. It's a state of mind, a mind of peaceful, a mind of calmness, a mind that we are not disturbed by anything, even though we might be in a situation of challenge, but our mind is always in, always in calmness, always in peaceful, always in a situation of brightness and positive, and that's nirvana. So Buddhists believe that we might face a lot of challenge in life, from our physical challenge to our mental challenge. However, if we are able to understand the truth of life, we are able to reach to the stage of nirvana. So again, nirvana is not a place to go to. Nirvana is a state of mind. And third, achieving nirvana means escape from the circle of rebirth. I mentioned that we have Buddhist belief in rebirth. However, rebirth will lead us to suffering because we're never able to escape out from this circle of birth and death. However, if we are able to understand what is the truth of, truth of mind, we are able to let go, then we are able to achieve nirvana. And when we achieve nirvana, in all times, we already escaped from the circle of birth and death. We are no more in the mind of suffering, in the mind of defilement, in the mind of worries. We are in the mind of peaceful. Isn't that a nirvana? So once Gautama Buddha passed away, after 80 years of life in this world, 
having achieved nirvana and teach multitude his way of life, he ceased to exist as a distinct being. Which means that if a person achieved to the stage of the Buddha, he's able to, to escape out from the circle of birth and death. And it's up to him whether he wants to be rebirth again or not to rebirth again. It's all being controlled by himself. So again, Buddha is like all of us. He's not a god. He's a teacher. He teaches us what is the meaning of life. So what is the Buddhist metaphysics? The Buddhist metaphysics are dukkha first. The dukkha, life in this world, is filled with suffering. Dukkha means suffering. Buddhists believe that our life, from physical to mental, every day we are facing all kinds of challenge and make us uncomfortable. And this uncomfortable feeling means dukkha, barrier us, block us from the feeling of happiness and peaceful. Second, the metaphysics are, is anicca. What is anicca? Everything in this world is impermanent. Impermanent is anicca. Look at the things around us. We are facing with all kinds of changes. Everything changes all the time. The books will change. The flower will change. You will change. I will change. None of the things in this world are unchanged or permanent. So this change will lead us to uncomfortable feelings. We hope that everything will be here forever. But unfortunately, things won't be here forever. So that's why Buddhists believe that everything in this world is impermanent. And that's anicca. And third, anatta. Ananta means the self, or we call it the soul, is also impermanent. There's no eternal, unchanging self like all of us. We call our self, self. But look at our self. We were, we were a baby many years ago. We grow up to become a child. After that, we grow up to become a teenager. And then we grow up to become a youth and an adult and then an old person. And after that, we pass away. So is there any unchange in our life? No, we change all the, all the time. So what is self? Is there a real self here? The definition of self means that there's no change in this entity. But nothing in this world is unchanged. So anatta, self, is also impermanence. So suffering is a state of mind. Achieve a balanced, peaceful, detached state of mind and suffering can be extinguished and that is the stage of nirvana. When we understand about this impermanence of things around us, when we understand about ourselves is also impermanent, anything that we attach to, because we understand about the impermanence, we are able to let it go. When we let it go, when our state of mind is in peace, then that is the state of nirvana. And that's why in Buddhism, how do we release out from suffering? From the mind. How does Buddhism differ from Hinduism? Buddhism rejects authority of the ancient Vedic texts. The Vedic caste system, Buddhism rejects it. Buddhism also rejects the Vedic and Hindu deities. Buddhism rejects the efficiency of the Vedic worship and ritual. And Buddhism rejects the concept of Bhatma. So, in a way, Buddhism rejects the ancient traditional Hinduism text and belief, and especially the caste system. Buddhism emphasizes on the equality. There's no such thing as who is higher, who is lower, who is greater, who is smaller, who is better, who is worse. In Buddhism, Buddhists believe that everybody is equal. We might have differences in our gender, in our ability, but there's no difference in our Buddha nature. So all of us, all sentient beings, has Buddha nature, and this is what the Buddhists believe and taught by the Buddha. And how does Buddhism differ from Jainism? Buddhism rejects the concept of Atman, the practice of strict atheism and withdraw from the world and vegetarianism as required. Buddhism emphasizes 
a lot about outreach to people, to be able to help people, to be able to lead people to release out from suffering. So Buddhism is to reach out. We share everything with people. We don't just practice for our own liberation. And that's Buddhism. And Buddha never required the Buddhist monks or nuns to become a vegetarian. Monks and nuns go out for alms round to ask for food from people. And monks and nuns do not have the uh, rights to reject what are food to be given to them. So Buddha never required Buddhists to be a vegetarian. However, a lot of Buddhists are vegetarian is because of compassion. Because we do not bear to, for another beings to uh, sacrifice in order for us to eat. So that's why we practice vegetarianism is because of our compassion mind. It's not because of we want to be vegetarian. We want to be compassionate to all beings, including the pigs, the cow, the sheep, the chicken. So this is why Buddhist, Buddhism rejects vegetarianism as a, a requirement. And what are some Buddhist texts? What are the Buddhist texts? There are three types of Buddhist texts, main type. We call it the Tipitaka, the Pali Canon, or the Tree Basket. This Tree Basket contains the text in Buddhism. The first text or the first basket is called the Vinaya. Vinaya is the discipline, or we call it the precepts, the rules for monastic life. The second, Sutra, we call it the discourse, the sermon or the teachings of the Buddha. The third, Abhidhamma, the metaphysical teachings, the writings from the senior monks or nuns to record down what they experience from the teachings from the Buddha. So it's a commentary written but now by the old monks or senior monks or nuns. So we have these three baskets, the Vinaya, which is the precepts, the Sutra, which is the discourse or the teachings, the Abhidhamma, which is the commentaries. And there's a, another very important text called the Abhidhamma. Abhidhamma is the collections of the Buddha's teachings or sayings. The Buddha has a lot of conversation, official and unofficial conversation with different people. So these conversations are being, were being recorded down by people. And then it's just like a story, like a grandfather talking to a grandchildren or a father talking to a son. So this is called the Abhidhamma. And of course, there are also many other texts in the uh, Buddhism and when it spreads to uh, many different places, it develops its own school, they also create their own texts. So how Buddhism spread around? How do Buddhism spread it? Within two centuries after the Buddha died, Buddhism began to spread north and east into Asia. By 13th century, Buddhism had disappeared from India. So I will not... Uh, it, talk a lot about uh, the disappear of Buddhism in India in this session, but in uh, our history of Indian Buddhism, I will give more uh, explanation on how Buddhism disappeared in India. The schools of Buddhism, how many schools uh, were being developed in Buddhism? The first school we, we, I would like to discuss is the Theravada school. The Theravada school is also called the Way of the Elders or some people call it the small vehicle. It is the oldest school of Buddhism, founded in Southern Asia, Sri Lanka, Burma, Thailand, etc. Monastic Zism is the ideal life for the achieving Nirvana. A do-it-yourself approach to enlightenment. Focus on wisdom and meditation. Goal is to become a Buddha. Fairly unified in belief and practice. Some culture differences. Theravada is the oldest school in Buddhism. It emphasizes a lot about, about self-practice, emphasizes about meditation, self-liberation, and that's why some people call it as the small vehicles. And it emphasizes about do it yourself, practice it yourself, and the goal is to achieve Buddhahood. And um, it has a lot of uh, belief in its school, but the focus of the belief is still in the begin the uh, basic teachings of Buddhism, such as the Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, and Three 
Damasio. The second school that I would like to introduce is the Mahayana school. The Mahayana school is also called the Great Vehicle. Developed first century CE, found in Northern Asia such as China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, lay Buddhism, Buddhism for the masses, devotional, Sikh guidance from Bodhisattva, which we call it the wise being, and heavenly Buddhas such as the Amidabha Buddha. It focuses on the compassion practice. The goal is to become a Bodhisattva and help other people towards enlightenment. That's the Bodhisattva ideal. Diverse, diverse school and sects, including Pure Land, Tian Tai, and um, Chan Buddhism, are also the Mahayana Buddhism. So Mahayana Buddhism, in a way, is to uh, practice the Bodhisattva path, whereby to help people to liberate, rather than focus on self-liberation first. And it help, it's focused on how to develop a compassion mind, to feel for other people. And that's why a lot of lay people practice the Bodhisattva path, to help people. But doesn't mean that the monastic are not practicing this path. Actually, in a way, is that Theravada Buddhism, even though people say that they are small vehicle, but actually they are doing a lot of Bodhisattva uh, actions or activities. Because, for example, in Sri Lanka or Thailand, a lot of Theravada monks, they have the center to, uh, to take in those AIDS uh, patients or orphans to take care of them. So they are the monks that to take care of these patients, these sick people, and take care of the orphans or take care of the old people. And it's not the, the just they practice by themselves. So a lot of people misunderstood Theravada uh, school, thought that they only seek for self-liberation. But in a way, Theravada practitioner, they quietly practicing the Bodhisattva path in order to help people. And Mahayana school, they reach out greater, whereby they organize a lot of big activities to recruit more people to be able to come into the temple or come into Buddhism to purify their mind. And that is the Mahayana school. A school of Buddhism, the Tibetan Buddhism. Tibetan Buddhism is also called the Vrajayana Buddhism or the Diamond Vehicle. It was developed 7th century CE, a mix of Theravada and Mahayana. It emphasized on ritual, which we call the Tantra, in three areas. First, the mantras, the chanting. Second, the mandalas or the tankas, the symbolic images. The third, the mutras, the hand gesture. So the Tibetan practitioner, they have to practice the mantra by memorizing the mantra to do their chanting. They have to be able to visualize the image of the Buddha or the Bodhisattva using the mantra, uh, mandalas or the tankas as the symbolic image. And they are able to have to learn to do the hand gesture, the mutra, to be able to focus on the visualize. At the same time, they also practice the Bodhisattva way and uh, to help people to spread the teachings of Buddhism to more people. And this person includes the Dalai Lamas practicing the Bodhisattva way. And of course, since they are combining the teachings from the Theravada and Mahayana, they emphasize a lot about meditation, monasticism, wisdom, and compassion as their main practice. And there is another school which, uh, which is also very popular, which is called the Zen school or the Chan school, which also called the meditation school. It, was, it is practiced by both lay and the monastic, seek sudden enlightenment through meditation, arriving at emptiness and the Buddha nature. Use of meditation teacher as their guidance. And they use different types of ways for them to visualize in order to focus their mind and do their contemplation. So the um, Zen Buddhism or Zen school, they emphasize a lot about meditating to reach to the sudden enlightenment of what is the truth of life. And also the contemplate on the emptiness in this world including ourselves, in order to see the Buddha nature in ourselves. And that is the goal of the, uh, the practice in Zen Buddhism. And Buddhism spread from Asia, Southeast Asia, to Central Asia. And after that, 
for recently extend uh, spread to the Western country. Over the past two centuries, especially since the later half of the 20th century, Buddhism has made its root into the Western world through few paths. The first, immigrations of ancient people who have brought their diverse form of Buddhism to the West. So the immigrants like me, a Chinese nun, came from the Chinese world to the Western world to introduce Buddhism to the Western uh, people. Another group, the Western followers who tend to adopt meditation practices and the philosophy rather than more devotional form of Buddhism. Many such Western followers remain within their own faith traditions, finding Buddhism to be a complement to rather than in conflicts with other religions. So a lot of Westerners, they, they have their own beliefs, they have their own faith, such as Christian or Catholic or Jewish. They have their own faith. However, when they start to know about Buddhism, they realize that Buddhist or the teachings in Buddhism are able to help them in their life and they want, would like to take in Buddhism as one of their beliefs. So they combine these two beliefs together to make it into their own uh, belief or their own religions. And that's why in recently there's a term called Jubu. The Jewish people, they become a Buddhist and they become a Jubu. And they are not that much devotional in, uh, in practice of Buddhism, not much in chanting, but they emphasize a lot about the teachings in Buddhism and also they practice meditation. So these two groups remain independent of one another. There's no conflicts between these two groups of belief. A Christian can at the same time become a Buddhist. A Jewish can at the same time become a Buddhist. A Catholic can also be at the same time become a Buddhist. The most important thing is that whether they accept it or not. And Buddhism to, to Buddhists, the door of Buddhism is always open to everyone, regardless of races, belief or tradition. And that is the belief in Buddhism. So again, what is Buddhism? Is Buddhism a religion? Is Buddhism a philosophy? Is Buddhism a faith? Is Buddhism a life? What is Buddhism? It depends on what you believe in. If the things that you believe in is what you believe in, that is Buddhism. If the things that you don't believe in and you never believe that, that is not Buddhism. So Buddhism, there's no definite definition of what is Buddhism. It's a belief, a belief of life. And all of us have different life. We have different karma. So our beliefs are different. So today we have this brief introduction about what is Buddhism. And I hope that you have a better understanding about a, the, the nature of Buddhism and also how Buddhism spread out to so many places. Thank you very much and good night.